joining us tonight from Emerson Process Management. So, uh, Will, for uh, agreeing to come along on this dark and dingy October night and talk to us. Um, I haven't got an awful lot of bio about yourself, William. Um, so, um, I'll just uh, do a quick one. So, you've got a master's in physics and mathematics and a postgraduate c certificate in process automation, instrumentation, and control. And you work as a project instrument engineer, field service sales engineer for instrumentation, and now wireless specialist. That's what Tracy gave me. Um, so, if you want to introduce yourself a bit further after that, then uh, over to you, mate. If you want to take over the screen, buddy. Super. Thanks, uh, Dave, for the intro. Um, let me let me know when you can see my screen. Super should be on now. I bet I'm muted, aren't I? Can you see my screen, everyone? Yeah, we can see that. Super. Um, so yeah, thanks for the intro. Thanks for having me along. Um, I'm not a Northwest member, but I'm a member of the Midlands section, and uh, I sort of interact with some of the other sections as well, North, uh, Northeast, and Lincolnshire being two um, two I've interacted with historically. Um, I'm Will Brown from Emerson. Um, job title is kind of wireless specialist. Uh, so in that, at the minute, I help deploy um, wireless networks at uh, industrial sites, lots in the area, and and kind of all about the country. Um, but as part of that as well, I also end up inevitably having big conversations about architectures and um, how that how that sits in a in a process uh, environment. Um, I am part of our plant web team in Emerson. That's our like digitalization team. So I work with um, other colleagues who focus on perhaps analytics or um, reliability monitoring or all sorts of things, and we kind of we're our sort of digitalization arm, which is away from our core, um, perhaps some of our core systems or instruments, those kind of things you know us for historically. Um, worked up in Aberdeen, project instrument engineer. So I was uh, up there for a while. That was a fun experience if anyone's ever lived and worked up there. Um, I think the oil price came down the week I moved up there. So uh, perhaps I'll be to blame for that. Um, yeah, that's a bit about me. Um, thanks very much for having me along. I'll. Um, get started we're going to talk I'm going to talk tonight a bit about how we in Emerson might build some of our architectures particularly around digitalization um, and when I say how we build really what we're trying to do nowadays is focus on the Namur open architecture standard for um, digitalization so I don't know if anyone's seen this recognized this um, but it's a <laughs> standard that is there to um, really help align industry vendors um, and sites in terms of how they would deploy these kind of uh, architectures in a, sta in a more standard way. Um, so based on a lot of existing field standards already, so you'll see OPCUA features heavily in there, which is kind of quite a, uh, a powerful standard. Lots of the field buses um, as well. Uh, you'll see um, Profinet mentioned a little bit later on and some other things. Uh, so there's lots of industrial standards used. Um, really, why is this being brought about? Well, we're seeing lots more digital content coming forward. We're seeing the pace of digitalization come in. Um, stop me if I say digitalization too many times because it's something I, I use a lot, right? Um, we're seeing that industry for everyone's talking about those kind of things. Well, this is actually a framework to try and deploy that in a in a practical and um, real way. Why was it designed? Well, it was designed to keep the core process control and the plant available and that sort of in its own space. But it was also designed to be um, vendor agnostic, really, in that space. So the idea with the with the Nomura Open Architecture is it sort of wraps around the core process environment and it really um, augments that capability rather than replaces it. So with these kind of architectures, we're not replacing core process architecture. In fact, some of the ones I've deployed, where well, we've deployed wireless technology and we've deployed that on um, onto sites where they've got a control system that doesn't even speak heart, for example, it's, it's that old. So you can really have a mix of um, core process control and, and um, 
plant data there. Um, also, one of the key things with it is security is, is designed in mind. Um, one of the things we experience a lot with the Internet of Things, IoT, is you hear about people's baby cameras getting hacked or those kind of things. A lot of IoT devices don't have intrinsic security within them. So automation security needs to be built in from the front end really um, here. So that's the Nomura open architecture. Um, have people seen this before? Has anyone interacted with it? Is it something they're familiar with? Um, no, let... I, haven't, I haven't seen it before. Does it kind of resonate? Like, is this something you think, wow, that looks useful or anything like that? Any Anyone comments on it? It's all good if not. I'm 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 just I will ask a lot of questions like that. So feel free to engage or not. It's no problem. Um, so some key parts of it. You've got the core process control. So that's typically a DCS. Doesn't have to be, but in a lot of the process worlds I interact in, we I would call that a DCS. So I might use that interchangeably with um with DCS, PLC, SCADA, your pick your flavor. Um, we've got that core process control. We've got a I, I like to talk about this as the digitalization pillar, but really it's a, a digital operational infrastructure that sits alongside that. That's probably based on the site. So plant specific type things where we've got um, analytics or, or information that's really relevant to that place. But then we might have central resource and lots of the companies that we work for interact with have centralized resource where they feed data to them a great example is rolls royce monitoring their engines from anywhere in the world back in derby you know that's that central um organization so we really want to try and make sure that the architecture we're designing kind of solve problems in all those spaces um there's a few things about data direction and data control i won't dwell too much on those um it's really Hopefully I'll take you through some examples of how we build these things um, and what some of the some of the pitfalls or some of the learning points might be. Um, the Purdue model really kind of plays a, a lot of experience in my day to day job. And I'm sure if you've if you work on industrial plant or um, interact with industrial processes, you'll often be talking about the layers of process control, where the firewalls are, those kind of things. Um, the this is our Emerson view of that Namur model, but sort of overlaid on the Purdue model. Um, so you kind of see the layers of layers of devices, field equipment, and then sort of moving up through the different layers of the plant. Um, one thing I'd like to draw on here is there's some interesting things. You know, we're talking about open interfaces a lot of time. So there's Heart IP we use as commonly in, as an open interface. Um, Profinet IO is in there. And you'll see that the greens are the are the open interfaces, but then we've also got proprietary interfaces in the core process environment. And I guess one of the reasons for that is security, right? Proprietary interfaces are often a lot harder to uh, hack or interface with. Cool. Um, how do we fit into that model? I'm sorry to kind of, I don't want to Emersonize this too much. I kind of want to keep it open, but my experience is based on how we take Emerson's digital ecosystem and we imprint it onto that model. So you'll see I've kind of color coded it to to bring it into the um, into the Namur environment. We call this core process control piece our digital foundation. So this is things we've been doing for a long time, right? And lots of people have. So intelligent smart field devices, um, control and safety systems and optimizing control loops, you know, things like that have been done for a really really long time um with great success so we're not trying to replace that in any way and we still that is still the heart of lots of these plants but what we have now is we have lots of capability in terms of technology both from our field devices um wireless is common you'll see lots of wireless devices along the bottom here um connectivity of that and then also the analytic and software platforms that sit on top and Hopefully you see that kind of wrapping over exactly like that Namur open architecture um, there. So lots of vendors have their ecosystems. This is ours um, and I'll be using com some components of that later on. And that's kind of why I want to introduce it. I don't want to do any more than that. Um, so why? 
why do we want to do why do we want to implement a digital architecture and why do we perhaps want to keep it separate from the control space so the first part is why are we doing it well very very frequently we've optimized control loops right we've got that closed loop control where we're taking some measurement producing a reaction and doing some algorithmic work to make sure we get the right feedback and that closed loop has been happening for years and years in process control however we often see in other areas so reliability um, safety and energy uh, emissions all those kind of things we would see that um, we're not closing the loop right there's a lot of manual processes like let's say manual steam trap rounds those kind of things where we keep going around with the clipboard and observing those things so we want to move to a um, to a closed loop in that space as well how do we close the loop there so for us that's using either existing data that we're not applying in that space we use or new sensors we're taking that to the right expertise so lots of organizations have to have centralized resource or outsource um, to other organizations and we want to have the ability to be able to get not just data from the field but something actionable from that so we call it actionable information so how can we take uh, vibration and turn that into actually this is the problem and how do I fix that um, and how do we automate that so how can we generate something automatically uh, everyone with me so far everyone happy super I'll take that as a as a yes um, David I see you've raised your hand S sorry mate I was just telling everyone everyone was good that was all so yeah. great perfect yeah. um, <clears throat> Again, we kind of see this in a little bit of a we talk about reactive and integrated workflows. It's the same uh, the same flavor. What we like to go from this sort of manual process is where we've got reactive workflow. So we're doing manual data collection. Typically, we're doing lots of different platforms and um, you know, you'll have seen that with the different silos of of data. You might have a vibration platform and a plant health platform and a um, lots of different pillars of data and they're not interacted with lots of different subject matter experts who are have only got access to their system and none of the data shall ever be crossed um, so the decision might take some time in which to be able to actually we've got the data but actually it's taken some, a lot of time to work out to make a consensus or to form a decision um, and then going actually yeah the pump owner has made that decision how do we get that into our system and, and into the workflow process uh, and automate that? So that's that kind of reactive workflow that we see. The, interact, uh, the integrated workflow is really about real-time data. So real-time for us might be instantaneous, but it might also be like once every five minutes, let's say, as opposed to once every three months. Um, the system is there to kind of take that data and make sure it's processed and understood. The decide piece is that we're not having to run all the calcs manually and then make a decision about what that is. So take a heat exchanger, for example. I know certain plants have once a month, the process engineer will download all of the data into an Excel file and run the heat calculation, the heat exchanger fouling calculations manually. We could just calculate that online. Now we could calculate online that's still seeing the data. That's not us helping to decide. What we want is some criteria in there that will say this heat exchanger is going to foul in three days or five days or 10 days or become inefficient, or this is how much it's costing us to run this fouled heat exchanger. Those are the kind of insights that we want to see. Um, and then the action is to be able to go, oh, that data's there. I can create a work order notification really, really quickly. I can create that and know that that's gone and that's fixed into that data and workflow and it's kind of all packaged together so that's the integrated workflow um, that we would love to move to cool so how do we build a if we call it a digital operational infrastructure or the the m and o piece the pink piece how do we build that um so these are kind of core principles that i like to adhere to is the data needs to go 
get the data where it needs to be. And what do I mean by that? It's about not burying it somewhere where no one can access it or it's not the right person looking at it. So a really good example here is wireless vibration or any vibration for that matter, but particularly with wireless vibration. Um, we could take this data and we could transfer it into the control environment via Modbus TCP. So we're getting system registers in there and we're doing all that kind of clever stuff. And that's that's great and can solve certain situations. I'm sure you were uh, the example expanded a little bit more um, in a minute. But what we what happens with that is we lose all of the richness of that data. So we lose all of the spectra, the vibration spectra that these devices are capable of measuring now. Um, the vibration engineer can just get the registers only because it's everything else is trapped way down in those in that core process environment. Um, and also we can't collaborate with another, any of our expertise. So we might have centralized vibration experts or third party experts that we would love to see that data. We can't share it with them. What we might be able to share is a trend from the control system, maybe, or an export of the data points. And what we really want to see is the is the rich data that sits within not just these Emerson devices, lots of smart devices out there. Um, so kind of objective one is get the data where it wants to go plug the device or the, the data path into the right layer of the architecture. Um, identify some key use cases. So that's about understanding what's going to bring you value um, and what what you what problem you're trying to solve, not just I need some vibration data, but why do you need some vibration data? Um, vendors, lots of vendors have lots of amazing use cases that they've deployed on plants and sometimes they might take a product and use it in a really weird or unusual way um, to solve a problem. So there's a, a talk to the vendors, right? They've got the product and expertise um, and can really give inspiration for use cases. Um, and then the idea with these things is to not make them an isolated project. That then just creates islands of data that aren't going to help anyone. You want to build with an idea that you'll scale it across multiple platforms. So that might be different measurement types, as an example, or it might be out further into the plant. Um, and the scaling of that should be done with using standard protocols from industry and I put interoperable technologies, but that's open standards really for me. Things like Heart or Foundation Field Bus or Profinet or Wireless Heart um, as examples. Those are all open standards um, that, that we utilize very often. So, cool. Just going to take a little sip of water. Um, so, some considerations around building these. Well, lots of the components that we want to use in that architecture already exist on plant, but we just need to either update them or upgrade them or get that trial license that we did and bring it into the right space and move it out of that core, that gray core process pillar, right? Get it out of there and get it to where it's going to, where the user is going to be able to see it. Um, a key project helps, right? One problem, one major problem that can get solved is the justification you need to put in infrastructure. And just buying infrastructure for the sake of it with no clear business case behind it is expensive. Um, so really, we're looking for that one key project that's going to justify, provide us that quick return and get that project, get that infrastructure going and that engine going. Or very often what I see is that we have a project that comes down from like a corporate IT sponsor and implements an infrastructure on a plant. Um, and we all understand there's some challenges with that, but very frequently we'll see centralized infrastructure projects coming into um, to industrial plants. I put this one here, we often control OT people, right? Um, not always, but very frequently. And engaging with uh, IT teams is absolutely key because a lot of this infrastructure is not hosted in a control space, it's hosted in IT infrastructure. And we need to make sure that they're aware of the technologies we're trying to implement, that we're conversing in the right way and that people are happy. So. I've put it, there's a little tangent here, but very often when I talk about wireless, people instantly think 
other wireless protocols and wireless heart, right? It's not a, you don't have experience it in your life. So a lot of IT people might think of LoRaWAN or, um, or even Wi-Fi. Um, kind of combating that, those barriers that are against certain industrial protocols is a really, can be a really key one. And I think the OT world, the process control world is way ahead of the IT world in terms of standardization of, of protocols. So, um, so really when we say, oh yeah, it works with this, I think in the IT world, that's a bit more, a bit more fluid. Um, I welcome any comments anyone's got on that kind of thing on their interaction with IT teams. Um, anyone, any, any thoughts? No problem if not. Um, so, so, David. So it's all quiet, Will. That's okay. Uh, IT teams usually uh, are an issue with uh, operational technology, I would have thought. Absolutely. I'm sure there's other people on the on the line that have similar issues with uh, IT people trying to get in involved in control systems and getting in the way. <laughs> I think, um, you know, we're not trying to, in this kind of conversation, we're not, we're not seeing them as the enemy, I guess. Um, and the core process environment, I absolutely agree. I think that still remains an operational space. You know, that 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 core gray piece, that the core gray pillar that we looked at. But the digital technologies, you're going to need that. We're going to need that IT buy-in, right? Um, of course, of course. Yeah. So, cool. It's, it's when they take it over and say, this is all ours because it's in computers. That's when you have the problems. You're absolutely right. You've got to have that... Um, you got to have the the engagement, but you've got to have some ownership too, right? It's an ongoing development relation developing relationship across the UK and all of industry. I think this whole ITOT, and I think every uh, company is having their different issues with it. It's just a relationship you've got to build and keep moving forward with it. And uh, Jason, I think you can probably, you know, I'm sure you can speak to that that relationship with IT and how it's working, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Super. So how do we begin? I'm not, uh, there's some commentary in here, but you know, listening, this is really an Emerson thing, right? We, what we're trying to do is take data from things that you already do. So workshops that you already have on site, lots of plants have uh, performance workshops or um, I'm not saying we encouraging having another sticky note exercise. That's the last thing we want to do. But we want to take some of the outputs from those things where you've invested time. Um, we want to look at corporate initiatives. Lots of uh, big corporate entities have um, industrial initiatives. You know what? It's probably going to be focused on pumps and heat exchanges and um, steam loss. Those are all things that affect everybody across every industry pretty much. Um, so how we deal with those things across industry can be pretty similar or we can have complementary solutions. Um, and if sometimes there's some really bespoke problems um, to a certain plant or a certain process. So understanding those is kind of key. Trying to put a value to them is the is the really uh, the really interesting bit. So value in terms of perhaps lost production also value in terms of things like safety um, value or uh, environmental value are becoming more and more prevalent in business case justification for in, in my experience anyway. Um, create the use case. So think about how the data might be used, who's going to interact with it, how it's going to work, not just we're trying to fix this specific problem. Um, and then I've put think about the now problem. So we've got to solve the now problem, but we also need to solve the maybe problem of tomorrow. Um, and that's a really perhaps slightly flowery way of putting that, but it's just trying to have an eye on how we're going to use these architectures in the future. Um, so I, I've got an example here. Hopefully the examples I'm going to use, they're all real projects. They're all D uh, debadged, but this is a, um, a vibration project they've been working on. Um, it's had a critical pump failure multiple times uh, at high vibration, up to 50 G of acceleration, which is which is a lot, right? This thing will really jump around this pump. And the it's from what I have been told, it's an operational problem. The, the pump is run ragged by the operator and we all love to rag on operations because 
they always break our things um, and cause us things to fix. But they have to operate the plant. And it seems like there's been no root cause work done on this particular thing. But regardless of, of the site's processes, they want to fix this problem. And what they want to do is they want to um, monitor the vibration on it. So we're causing, there's a big value here. There's 1.5 million pound of lost production. Um, that's a lot of money. And the operators, they know if it's vibrating a lot, they know they can twist the process, tweak the process, turn it down, for want of a better word, to, um, to extend the life of that, of that pump. They do have some things on site. They've got a handheld vibration tool, a vibration probe that they use once a month. Um, they've got no suitable field instrumentation and no cable infrastructure. So they would have to install new equipment. Um, and really what they want is they want a vibration data in the control environment so the operator goes, that pump's vibrating too much. So I think we could agree this would solve the problem, right? We could solve today's problem. The operator gets an alarm when a value hits 30G, the acceleration of the of the pump. Now 30G is a lot, right? But the operator gets an alarm. Um, the gateway, we're going to use wireless in this specific instance because it's me, obviously. Um, <laughs> the gateway is connected to the control system natively and we get scalar values in the control environment. And we can set an alarm on those. Happy days. Um, we've solved that problem. And you know what? That will work and it will probably extend the life of the, the pump, but the pump will still fail and still cause downtime issues. It might be that that alarm gets worn or the device clicks offline or there's some some operational thing where the pump is not actively being monitored. And this is still a reactive type thing, like the pump is vibrating too much. Um, also, what we're not hitting is any of the like lower level vibration problems. 30 G is quite high, if so we've set that alarm limit. Maybe we'll do some process changes and the pump will never vibrate at that again. Um, so we could use this and we could solve that immediate problem. And sometimes we need to act quickly to solve a problem. Um, but what we would like to do instead, uh, this is an architecture example that we've got, is we want to take, and I've used, this is actually, uh, this is just a standard Emerson architecture. So this could represent any vendor on the right here. Um, and hopefully you'll, it's just to represent that core process infrastructure. Um, what we want to do is we want to take that um, gateway that's talking natively to the control environment and we want to move that to a different space. We want to connect that to our machinery health software and then that's sat on a much higher layer so we can get all this rich vibration data up in our machinery health software and then we can get access to that from the business network. So the vibration engineer can look at that data. What we then might also do is we might put a OPC link in over the top back to the control environment. So we've solved the problem that the operator gets in a vibration alarm, but we've also got a um, access for a vibration engineer to be able to do some analysis and use those specialist skills by working out um, looking at vibration spectra, looking at energy banding, looking at all those clever things that the vibration engineers do. Um, and also in this architecture, it's really quick to be able to deploy a corrosion monitoring architecture alongside that the customer wanted to do. So that's kind of like phase one to phase two almost, if that makes sense. And you see how we're, we're still kept our core process control environment doing its thing, but we've got this digital operational infrastructure that's starting to build along the left hand side. So that's a really small example. Everyone with me so far making sense, hopefully. Yeah. Super. I said I'd do two examples. Uh, was there any questions at that stage? Sorry. So yeah, could you just go back? Are you, are you saying that you're putting law monitoring um, equipment in the field? Sorry, um, no, the, the, the vibration device is on the pump but it's not connected to the control space. It's connected into a gateway, which is plugged into the. Instead, uh, 
or as well as instead and we're providing that same signal via OPC like over the top if that makes sense in yeah. through a firewall rather than okay. natively okay. into the control space right okay if that makes That's, sense yeah just about the, the 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 positivity of that um Ian is that we're not taking scalar values into our control environment we're taking scalar values into our control environment over the top and all of the vibration spectra that the software can analyze, right? So we're getting all that rich data out. Which you wouldn't be able to do it the other way, presumably. Correct, yeah. Because right. this would be, this software would be trapped down here, your user would be up the top and security would not let you get between those layers. Right. Wouldn't be able to dial into the DCS environment, right, to see the vibration data. Okay, thanks. Does that make, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that helps, thank you. Um, feel feel free anyone to stop me for clarification on those things. So um, I've got an example of a new plant and I'm going to do a, um, a green a brown field site as well. So a new plant, really, we want to start with a, a, a bit of a timeline of how we're going to digitalize this plant. Um, this is quite a. This is a based on a real project example that's not sanctioned yet, but is in play, um, so it's quite a cool one. And the vision of the people designing the plant was that they wanted a, they want, they called it an industry four plant. Um, now, that means lots of things to lots of different people. What they wanted was core digitalization scope in there at the beginning, infrastructure for them to be able to expand over multiple years, basically, and think about the operational life of this plant, which in this case was 10 years. Now we all know operational life is going to be inevitably longer than that as people try to extend the asset life. Um, I'm sure for those people who work at, on some of our local chemical infrastructure that probably had a design life of 25 years and has been running for 60 maybe. Um, so um, so yeah, up the front immediately wanting to think about um, a WPN is a wireless plant network. That's a Wi-Fi architecture. So we're going to put Wi-Fi in in the beginning. We're going to have some um, devices in there, some gateways in there to allow uh, additional measurements, and we're going to have something on OEM skids. This is kind of just a, a bit of a, a high level view of, of these things. I'll, I'll jump into the architectures if, um, so you can show. So we've got a build phase. We've got like a day one, turn the plant on phase. We've got a year one phase and we've got a year three phase. So that's kind of how this how this digitalization plan would look over minus eight months, let's say, right up to three years of operation. Um, so I've mentioned something called optics in there. I'm just going to go through what that is because it's quite core to this digitalization strategy. So just a quick tangent on that. Do bear with me. Optics is a collaboration platform in Emerson. We can take in data from lots of different pillars and also from third party pillars. And then we can provide an interface to a workflow system, so an SAP or a Maximo typically. Um, but we also have in there the capability to message, um, provide data mobility and deliver content to people specifically based on their user role. So it's quite a it's a collaboration platform. That's all I'm going to say on that. It's not not me sales pitching. It's just core to some of the digitalization scope. So. Building the plant. Core environment is getting built and we're working with the process team heavily. We are implementing a wireless infrastructure to begin with. So that's a Wi-Fi infrastructure from day one. So that's going in as the plant's being built. We're not running a Wi-Fi mesh in this instance because we don't need to. We can run fiber optics to every single one of our access points um, out there in the field. We're going to use that network to actually use that same inf Wi-Fi infrastructure to enable the um, the control space. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on that too much because that's a core process control issue, but we will use our digital, some of our digital infrastructure to enable that. We'll do some security protocols to keep the operators data and uh, information separate. Um, within the Wi-Fi, but we will use the same Wi-Fi architecture. And then we'll have um, the Wi-Fi access point sat there happily. We've also got our device communicator and our um, asset management software there that allows us to track all of the changes and all of the configuration issues that might go on on a plant from 
the build phase. So that's key to having that up the front. The end user might also not just use this Wi-Fi network for Emerson applications, right? They might use that for lots of applications on tablets out in the field. The other thing is we have a um, uh, a box of tr a vibration tricks, basically, that can be fixed onto a, a skid and built and then we will connect that via Wi-Fi as that arrives. So all of the OEM skid packages that will be built, will have this assembled onto them. And then when that arrives on site, it's a very simple connection, no analytic creation, no graphics, just straight feed into our software. Um, so that's day one, build, sorry, build one. Go live, we're gonna implement a the optics server, which allows us to take data from all of these platforms and collaborate with the business system up above. So we are instantly able to start using the workflows up on the top layer, even if we've not even got some of the data that we need down the bottom layer. We're starting to use some of the um, some of the workflow notifications. So just some key points. Wi-Fi from the beginning is absolutely core. Um, imagine building a house now and not thinking if you were going to have Wi-Fi. Right, it'd be exactly the same on an industrial, brand new industrial plant. Um, collaboration platform providing uh, connections between devices, device layers, um, tablets in the field. So providing access, not just to our analytics, but whatever um, other platforms that the end user might have and separating out the operator Delta V and the digitalization platform. Cool. So that's a new ish plant or a new plant. Um, not yet built, actually. Any questions on that? All good. Existing plants then. So something perhaps we're all a bit more familiar with, uh, maybe or maybe not. Um, so this plant. We're going to assume it's got an Emerson control space, but again, we're not really going to touch the white very much, or if we are, we're going to touch it with an industrial standard protocol, I hope. So in this sense, we've not building a plant with uh, a timeline in mind. We're actually taking some use cases that exist on our plant now when we want to either automate them for safety or productivity reasons. So we identified some phases in phase one. We wanted to automate some of the operator rounds, so they were manually still taking pressure gauge measurements. So going around the plant with a clipboard uh, or taking the clipboard and then going back to the office and inputting that. So we wanted to automate those those monitoring processes, the operator processes. Um, we wanted to create um, an OPC link to the control system. So to sort of provide the the channel for the digital operational ecosystem to 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 contribute to the control space and we wanted to um, allow the operators to work in the field and that really isn't in the scope of the digitalization uh, space but we might use some of the similar infrastructure so we think about that and we try and always think about how we're going to integrate um, those things so that looks something like this pretty similar right we're going to see a lot of this so we've got Wi-Fi networks again down the bottom. We've got pressure gauges for monitoring the pressure in the field and we've got some applications. I'm not going to dwell on these too much at all. And then we're taking this OPC data to both the process data historian and back down into the control space. So you see that link coming over the top. Um, Phase two of the project was to look at device diagnostics. Now we already had this server present, right? So we already had our diagnostic server, but it just needed a significant update. Um, it had been installed and sat running in the control space and had been utilized, but hadn't really been able to be updated because of where it was living. So we needed to refresh that. And we also needed to provide access to other users in there, not just people in the control space, but other people from parts of the plant. Um, so phase two looks something like this. So we updated this space down here. We updated this space and we created a 
architecture at the top. Cool. Phase three starts to get a bit more interesting now is we're looking at machinery health and machinery diagnostics. So that might be pumps um, or heat exchangers on this particular site. We've already got the wireless infrastructure in. Um, we're going to put in some new prediction systems and we're going to use a data con uh, collector and concentrator. We're then also going to, this is the kind of the big guts coming in here. We've done a lot of the, the infrastructure work and this is really the, the decision and the um, the guts of the of the data uh, handling and integration software coming in. But one of the key things they actually wanted was they wanted the data, the machinery health data to be mobile using the Wi-Fi infrastructure that we had. And they also wanted to be able to interact with it off premises. Um, so quite a lot of big challenges there. So look at the purple coming in now, some big infrastructure coming in down the bottom connecting into um, data concentrators and data collectors. You'll notice we've got the optics server here. This will start to, this will be the backbone for when we integrate with the SAP system. Um, we've also got a analyzer, handheld analyzer still. So we're still using that for some key assets that might not warrant critical or balance of plant type monitoring. And then we've got a secure link all the way out to the internet so we can use our our servers to the right layer of configurations to get access out to the to the outer world i say the internet like maybe corporate wan or something of that architecture type um and then phase four is really about taking all those different things that we've created that ecosystem and integrating it with the control space and that is mostly just process creation and process work. So that's not really using anything. There's a few extra bits of software coming in here. Um, some analytics software, some machine learning starting to come in. Um, but the CMMS system takes an interface and we start to connect that in. Um, we start to get re ready for OPC clients to be able to pass data either to other systems or back to our system um, and back to our data concentrator. And you'll notice we've built this entire digitalization architecture right alongside the control architecture to really augment it and get data up into the business layers. Um, so that's a long process, right? And you have to have a plan from the beginning about how you're going to scale to this layer. Um, just dropping in one or two devices is not going to cut it. Um, our original use cases are still there and still performing but we're really able to add value using the same ecosystem that we've already got. And that's pretty much it from me. Um, welcome any thoughts, questions, 